Hi all, welcome. I see we've got some attendings, attendees sort of trickling in. Uh, my name is Anantha Singaraja and this is the AEM Women in EM Sections uh, Osteopathic Mentorship Series. I'm here with some lovely panelists who I will introduce in a second, but I want to let everyone know that this message being recorded. So in case you miss anything or you want to recap, uh, it will be posted on our Women in EM's uh, website uh, tomorrow or 48 hours from now. So feel free to ask any questions. Uh, this se session is for you all. So uh, let us know, uh, put in put questions in the Q&A or in the chat, and I'll make sure that we speak out loud and make sure you're heard. So today we're joined by uh, Alika Glor Fernandez, who is a PG1 at Emory. We've got Dr. Deborah Pierce, who is a PD at Einstein. We've got Shana Ross, who is an APD at UIC. We got um, Dr. Megan Gillespie, who's done the EM FM combined program. And uh, hopefully we'll have uh, Angie Carrick, Dr. Angie Carrick, uh, come join us. Uh, she is currently an assistant dean at KCOM. So if she can jump in, then uh, we'll, we'll let you all know. And if all of you would like to go ahead and just kind of give a little bit more uh, details about yourself, so that would be great. Dr. Pierce, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Hi, I am Deb Pierce. I am the program director at Einstein in Philadelphia. I have been there for a while. I did my, um, at my med school at PCUM and then my residency at Einstein. Then I worked at Cooper in Camden, New Jersey for seven years. And then I transferred back to Einstein. I've been the PD, was the APD for a while and now I've been the PD for the past five years. And I'm excited to be here and to talk to all of you lovely ladies about anything regarding your future success. Hi guys, I'm Alika Fernandez. I am a PGY1 at Emory. It's crazy being on this side of things since I was just in your shoes literally a few months ago. Um, so just let me know uh, if you have any questions because I was just right there. Hi guys, Shanna Ross. I am from Wyoming, then the ways of Colorado, and then went to medical school out at Western University. And then I came to UIC, was a resident there, was a chief resident there. And then I was initially the assistant program director and I've been in the associate role for the program directorship um, for the last, I think, three years now. So very excited for you guys to be here. Really excited to help you guys with your personal statements because, um, I read on average around anywhere from like four to 600 personal statements a year. And so I'm really excited to help you guys. So that way I don't have to read any more bad ones. That's the whole goal of this, right? No more bad ones. I'm Megan Gillespie. And as Anantha said, I just graduated from Jefferson Northeast, formerly Aria Health in Philadelphia in their combined EM FM program. And I just finished up my chief resident year, so I can kind of give you some insight to what chief residents look at when they're looking through your personal statements, applications, and interview questions if we get to that tonight. Um, and I just started my job as an attending at uh, Penn Medicine, and it's going good so far. Sorry, guys. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> just dropped my computer. Um, my name is Angela Carrick. I am in Wichita, Kansas. I just moved here to uh, take a job as an associate dean of pre-medical education at the about to open Kansas, well, I should say proposed Kansas College of Osteopathic Medicine. So slated to open um, a year from now. But I was formerly associate program director of the emergency medicine residency in Norman. So happy to be here tonight. Wonderful. And so I guess to kick us off, um, why most of us are here today is to um, find out the do's and don'ts of personal statements and CVs. So I'm going to kind of just open it up on to the floor. Um, if you want to give your input on just what you want seen in a personal statement, what you don't want to be uh, see in a personal statement, and just in general uh, tips and tricks. 
I think a good rule is always don't tell me what an ER doctor does, right? I think so often they're like, they talk about multitasking and all of these things that they like about the ER. And we, we kind of know that that's why you guys are applying to emergency medicine. We understand what it takes to be an ER physician. We understand what ER medicine means, right? Like emergency medicine and like what goes into it, but we want to know why you are into it, right? Like what about you and your path and your career and your skills and your expertise, why you want to be an emergency medicine physician, the kind of generic stuff for me, at least when you go like, I played soccer, so I'm good on a team and I was a waitress or a waiter. So I'm really good at juggling things, right? It's like, I, I understand all of those things, but why do you want to do ER? Because a lot of specialties, you have to have teamwork and a lot of specialties, you got to juggle different things, but why emergency medicine for you personally? I'm going to say, um, when you're writing your personal statement, remember the attention span of not only an adult, but an emergency medicine physician. And remember how many hundreds or possibly uh, thousands um, of personal statements that these leadership uh, that the leadership in programs are reading. So please, um, you know, just, I would say one page is plenty. I would just figure out, um, you know, like Dr. Ross said, you know, what you want to say about why you're doing emergency medicine. And then think of, um, you know, something interesting about yourself. It's a personal statement. So, make it personal. I think everybody always likes to hear something about you, something about, um, you know, a hobby. Um, and I would say be prepared to answer questions about anything you put in your personal statement, because if you write it, you probably will get answer, asked questions about that in your interview, which is why something like a hobby is good because it kind of breaks the ice for you. I would say it makes you comfortable to talk about something you love and that you're, you're good at. And the other thing about personal statements is it is a time if, if there was anything that happened to you in medical school that you need to address, like you, you didn't pass the boards or something happened and, you know, you could address that in your personal statement so that if that's the one thing people you know, are, are deciding uh, or using to make a decision on whether to give you an interview or not um, have in front of them, um, then there, there you go. Put something about, you know, this happened to me and this is how I, I learned from it and what, how I fixed it and overcame it. So I think those are a few things I would say about um, personal statements. I think too, um, and it's a little bit hard to do it for every personal statement, but if there's a particular program or place that you're really interested in, um, kind of like why that city or why that place too, um, as opposed to just kind of, it's sometimes hard to do that if you're applying to a large number, but if you're really interested in a place, kind of why that specific place, if there's any particular reason. Going off of that really quickly, make sure that you're researching your programs really well, because for example, last year, Emory required us to include in our personal statement, why Emory specifically. So it's a big red flag if you don't answer the one question they asked you to on your personal statement. Um, that's actually the first I've heard that somebody required something in their personal statement. So I don't, how did they translate that to you when you were doing the application? How did you know that they wanted that? It was on their website. So that, you know, I guess be careful and look at websites because I didn't realize that people, I didn't even know that it was okay to request that. I haven't, I haven't done that, but I it would just add to what, um, these guys have said so far. So I think that one of the things that I just really wanna see in your personal statements is passion, passion about something. Like don't, to just have it be factual or, you know, very scientific is 
not really valuable. That is, um, it doesn't really tell me anything about you. And I do use the personal statements a lot. I, I use it to figure out who you are and whether you have characteristics that I can pull out of that, that I look for in residents that I believe will succeed at Einstein. So I have certain characteristics I look for and there's certain things that people um, do in their background. There's hobbies, there's activities, there's, there's different things that are, that indicate to me what type of person you are and what makes you tick and um, what you enjoy doing and whether or not I think that you'd be somebody who would be happy training at Einstein for four years. And the goal is to try to get a, a class of residents who are gonna be as happy as you can be as a resident for four years. So um, trying to, to describe yourself and letting us see who you are and see beyond just um, the, the kind of superficial stuff. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be dramatically um, revealing or anything like that, but just having, painting a picture of who you are that you would want me to know so I can figure out whether or not <clears throat> I think that um, we'd be the place for you. Um, and then I, I do agree that it's an opportunity for you to explain any kind of red flags in your application or things that are gonna be question marks in your application. For example, I had a student talk to me the other day about, um, I, they have citizenship in Canada and they're trying to figure out how to navigate the US system, but they expect that they're gonna have a green card and blah, 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 right? So ex kind of explaining that background might be important because it may be important to a program to know whether or not they have to financially support a visa. Likewise, if you took two years off for some reason from medical school, and it isn't uber clear that you did a master's or a, you know whatever reason that you took off, try to explain that because it is something that we would look for in your application. And if it's something even, you know, you took care of a loved one who was sick for a year or something, um, it can be very valuable to be able to understand gaps and that kind of thing. So don't hesitate to explain anything that might not be clear. The other place that you can explain things is with your dean and your dean's letter. You can ask your dean to make sure they write in their letter why you took a gap year or something like that. But passion, give us some passion. And for what it's worth, I think the personal statement's gonna get more and more important as time goes on because we're getting less and less other information. So especially right now with having only two slows, I look at every personal statement. I think it's a really important part of your application. So don't, don't just kind of brush over it. Take some time with it. I agree completely. I mean, I think the hammer point point that you said, like passion, right? And that's really like, make it personal, right? Like it is a personal statement for a reason. And I agree. So at UIC, we're pretty transparent about how we like do selections and things like that. Right now, our board scores are less than 5%. And your personal statement weighs over 50% of whether or not you're going to get an interview or not, right? And then the other part is a slow. And the reason why the slow, normally it's like, closer to 50-50 with the two, but right, like home institutions always love their students and they fluff it up and, you know, and it's always a little hard to figure out, at least last year, whether or not, you know, people really were really excelling, because I mean, some of the slows were virtual slows too, right, like they're like, I've never even met this student, but this is what I think from them online, you know, which was a unique year, and luckily this year you guys got a chance, you've done your actual slows, but you know, pretty soon, regardless if you decide to take USMLE or not, right, like it's going to pass fail. I don't know if Comlex will do their stuff. Um, Comlex one is pass fail ever, but USMLE is transitioning to that. And that's eventually like, right, like no one's going to be able to use scores to weed people out anymore. There's no more crap class grades. There's no more class ranks, right? Like, so really we only want to know who are you? Like, what makes you tick? Like she said, what is your passions? But I really agree with Andrew when she was like, know what you wrote in there. Um, and nothing is a bigger red flag than when I'm like, this was a great personal statement. I interview them and I bring something up and they have no idea at all what I'm talking about. And I'm like, but, and then I'll like open up the file and be like, but didn't you write this? And they'll be like, 
uh, oh yeah. And then all of a sudden you can see this like terror on their face because they forgot they wrote about something or they were heaven forbid like elaborated on something and essentially was lying about something. And so they didn't really know, right? Like be honest in it, right? And here's the thing, people are like, should I be put this in my personal statement or not? Like, will what will program judge me for that? If that's you who you are, you don't want to go to that program anyways. Or if they're going to judge you on your personality and be like, nope, this person, that's the whole point of this is to screen them out because you also don't want to go to a program that doesn't actually like you as a person because you're going to be miserable. And if you're miserable, you're not going to learn no matter how great the institution is. And if you don't learn, you're going to be a bad doctor and none of you wasted all your good years and all that money to be a bad ER physician in the end. I can't kind of emphasize both what Dr. Pierce um, and Dr. Ross just said. You know, I know there's a lot of high anxiety around this time when you're trying to match and you're like in your head, I would just want to match anywhere. Um, but really you want to match at a program that accepts you and also is like willing to teach you and grow you. Um, like to me, it would be, I, I mean, I don't know, like being unmatched and then being in a program that doesn't really accept you as you are or want to grow you is like kind of equal. I, I don't even know which one's kind of worse. So I just think being vulnerable in your personal statement, um, obviously not writing anything like crazy, but if it's something a little bit vulnerable that you're like a little worried about putting in there because you're not sure if it'll be liked by everybody, then I mean, they have Dr. Pearson, Dr. Ross have great points. You, you know, you don't really want those people to be having you if they don't like it, you know. That made me think of something when you said that. I'm not sure if I should put that in there. I think it's good advice to just write something out and then have, you know, your mom, your best friend, um, another, you know, have a couple people read it and then, um, you know, think, it, have them think about it in the context of, does this sound like me? Is this me? You know, this needs to be like you because you want to portray who you are as a person and of course is it grammatically good does it uh, you know are the punctuations right I mean you you don't really want to make spelling errors and even if you run spell check it still um, misses things because you can use the wrong version of a baby word and uh, it's still is spelled right, but it's not in the right context or, you know, little things that you just want to look like you've, you've read this and reread it. And, and even I've even heard somebody, I read it somewhere, try reading it backwards and, and look at it that way, uh, which I had never thought about. Um, so make sure and do that too. But I like the idea of having um, someone close to you read it. Yeah, or the computer changes the word on you. You know, it, it thinks that you were intending to use a slightly different word and then you end up with a completely wrong word there. Do not, do not have typos, poor word structure, um, wrong punctuation. Do not have any of those errors in your personal statement. When I see that, I have to tell you that that makes me nuts. And I really view that as negative because what it tells me is that you don't pay attention to detail and that you didn't take the time to read through a thing that is incredibly important for your future. And that makes me worry that you're not gonna care about every detail of a patient's case in the emergency department. And you're not gonna care about, you know, a lecture you have to give or something like that, that it's just do not do it. That for me would be a reason to not interview somebody. It's that significant. So um, absolutely get anybody who can to proofread it. And I'll tell you what, I have students ask me all the time to proofread their personal statements. There's students that have rotated with us and, you know, it is, I, that's why I do what I do. I love mentoring students and it makes me feel good to be able to read a personal statement and help you. So ask those, you know, docs you're working with to, to help you. And even a program director who, or an APD who looks at thousands of personal statements and, um, you know, just ask them to be honest and let you know what their thoughts are. We're happy to do it. And it's okay to admit, like, I'm really bad at grammar, horrible at grammar, never going to be good at it. Like, 
just, I understand that I'm not good at that. And I actually, my sister who did a lot of English and is English major, like she doesn't know what it takes to be an ER doctor or anything. She's not medical by any means, but I was like, I don't care about like the actual words in there. Like, does it make sense grammatically and fix all my punctuation? And it came back with like 48 red dots on it. And I was like, perfect. This is what I want, right? Like sh- fix this for me because I'm bad at that. And I'll always be bad at that. But after, after I write a scholarly paper, I'm going to pay somebody else to read it to make sure I don't sound like a dummy because I just cannot articulate. I mean, I don't sound that intelligent when I speak to you guys here. So just imagine me trying to write it down on paper. And there are a lot of great comments and links being added to the chat box. So please read that if you haven't. Um, To follow up on that, uh, there are people who recommend writing a different personal statement for every program. Um, What are your all's thoughts about that? How many programs are you applying to? Because if you're applying to three, sure, go for it. I'm happy. I have heard crazy numbers like people applying to a hundred programs. You are not going to write a hundred different personal statements. Now, if you do have like a longing love letter, right? And you're just like, I really, really want to go to this one place. I do know that. That is perfectly acceptable. But I, it breaks my heart when students like write separate personal statements for every single program, right? Um, Because one, that's just like not doable. I, a lot of times that students will write like a a normal personal statement and then just have one paragraph at the bottom dedicated to that site. And I think that that's okay and reasonable only if that is like your long lost love and you want, you know, you really, 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 really want to, and it's your top program or something along those lines. Um, but for me, I'll be honest, it doesn't change too much for me, right? Like, because if the rest of your personal statement is not personal and it's super generic and I can't tell that you're passionate about something and I don't get any idea who you are, you telling me you really, really want to come here. I'm like, well, that's great, but you're a total stranger still, right? So if your personal statement's not personal and you write me a love letter at the end, I don't, it's not going to change anything. Yeah. And to go along with that, Shana, if you put a love letter at the bottom of your personal statement for me, I'm really just thinking that you're putting a love letter at the bottom of 20 personal statements and for anybody else. So there's nothing until I talk to you when I'm evaluating your application for an interview, there's not really anything unless you say, you know, I am getting married next weekend in Philadelphia and my, you know, but my future partner is you know, CEO of a company in Philadelphia, we have to live there. You know, I mean, something dramatic, you could just write that wherever. But um, I I just have one quick comment. Do not apply to three places. (laughs) Um, From what Gina just said, you don't have to apply to a hundred places, but know that the, there's data on the NRMP website to show you statistically the likelihood of matching based on how many places you interview. So I, in an ideal world, if everybody could do it, and this doesn't happen for everybody, but if you interview at, you know, 11 or 12 places, you have a 99% chance of matching or whatever. So make sure that you don't put all your eggs in one basket because this is a computerized match. And sometimes things happen that none of us expect. So um, apply to enough places. And, And I agree, I would not personalize every personal statement. I actually was surprised to hear that about Emory. Um, And it is uh, one of my APDs is from Emory and she hasn't even told me that that was the case when we've talked about apps. So read the website, but um, but I don't think it's necessary to personalize everyone. Just my opinion. I agree with the statement, though, if you do have a really big connection with a city or a program, I've had students that did, you know, came and rotated with us and um, had some really good experience or and they wanted to put something about that in their statement, then I think that's okay. But putting, you know, I think it really needs to be a compelling reason to put something in there. Um, But if you have that and you feel like you should, then do it.
And Dr. Fernandez, you just did this interview trail last year. Um, did you get any comments about your personal statements or anything like that while on the trail? Um, a couple, because I talk about being an immigrant um, and how that shaped uh, me wanting to become a physician. But really most of, I felt like most of my interview trail was talking about my hobbies on that hobbies list on ERAS. Which is a great segue into the CV and tips and tricks for the CV um, and putting it onto ERAS definitely, but what you all see as red flags and green flags. So a great tip I was given was not to just list what I did, but also to say what I learned or gained from that experience. So I did that for every single one of them. Um, and I think that it paid off because when those things were brought up, um, it wasn't just, sorry about my dog. <laughs> it wasn't just, um, just a list of things. Like they actually got to know me a little bit more and were able to ask me more meaningful questions instead of like, hey, what was this? I think that also highlights too that um, things that should be on there are meaningful things to you, not like one thing you did on an off Tuesday in October of your second year in college or like weird stuff like that. So um, I think it's a little bit more about like quality over quantity. And I think we talked about a little bit in our last Zoom, but in particular, if you've had any positions or like organizations or things that you've kind of progressed your own role in, um, especially like any type of leadership roles, those are things that you wanna make sure that you're highlighting on your CV as well. And don't lie, right? Like if you, let's say you didn't have a lot of good quality leadership and you do want to just list, because let's say you were somebody that never got the opportunity to have a leadership position, but you did volunteer a whole heck ton, right? And you just volunteered at multiple different clinics in underserved areas, but they were all separate ones. List them all separately. That's fine. Just don't make up things and lie about it, right? I think those ones are always hard because we, we do read them, right? Like that's the whole point. Like we're reading these before we interview. We're reading these to select you and we're going to bring them up, you know, um, and don't over-exaggerate either, you know, like because you played on intramural soccer does not mean you volunteered, right? Like, and I, I often see that like intramural soccer captain, I volunteer. I'm like, no, that's just a hobby, right? Like that's just something you do for fun. Like that's not volunteer work. That's not service to your community, you know? And so don't try to over elaborate things or put a whole bunch of fillers in that aren't real. If you're going to put it on there, we're going to ask you about it. Um, somebody will probably ask you about it somewhere on your application or along the trail. And you just don't want it to reflect negatively on yourself, right? Like there's no need to. But do remember to put stuff in there. So I like um, an example is um, if you coached Little League, like that is something that people wouldn't think that you would put on a medical CV, but that actually shows a lot of aspects of your personality. Um, but, you know, I love seeing community service on a CV. However, make sure you really did do community service. Like Shana's referring to, if you spent one day at a soup kitchen, you know, don't, don't suggest that you have done a huge amount of, you know, years of community service um, if you can paint it as something you just started and that's okay, you know, sometimes we haven't done things for a long time, but you do it once and now you're, you're smitten, but, um, but don't misrepresent what you've done because we are going to ask you about it. Many, many, many students though, do not, um, put the, it, they don't, you don't give yourself enough credit. You don't put everything you've done on your CV so sit down and start with like, you know, college, maybe even the end of high school, if you did really significant stuff, like if you were an Eagle Scout, or if you were, you know, captain of your lacrosse team, or if you, if you were something significant that gave you experiences that, um, would contribute to what you're going to be as an emergency resident, that 
is important stuff. So sit down and really tease through everything. And then this is where um, family and friends can really come into play. Talk to your brothers, sisters, parents, friends, and say, you know, I'm trying to make sure that I tag everything for my CV. Is there anything that you can think of that I've done that that maybe I'm forgetting or I wouldn't have thought of? And um, that can be really, really helpful too. It's so true. I run like a, I do CV review nationally and I run like all of our CV reviews and I do it for not just the College of Medicine, but for our residents and then a little bit for the DME, the Department of Medical Education. And I think the, right, like it's not a resume, right? A resume is that high yield. This is your life's work. So if it's important to you and it shaped who you are today, it should be on your CV, right? Like people, like it was brought up, I was designated driver of the year at my undergrad right? Like they made me DD of the year out of 27,000 undergrad students, but that was part of who I was. And it was important to me. And I, I still have that on my CV today. I don't even care. No one's going to let me get rid of that. Like my CV, my, my things, right. But use the things that shape you, who you are, things that were pivotal to you, your growth, what make you you those all need to go on there you guys sell yourself short like ah it was an award but it was like a little award put it on there right it was still an award not everyone at that school not everyone at that program got that don't be ashamed i mean imposter syndrome is real all of you are suffering from it right now none of you want to say how great you are but you guys remember like think back to your pre-med days like half your friends didn't become doctors you're here you're going to be an ER doctor. We're going to party at ASAP and AAM in like four to five years. And you're all going to be attendings then, right? Like it'll be okay. You guys are amazing people. Let us know. So I'm going to, I'm going to say that you guys should definitely look at the, the documents I put on there. And there's a couple of things that I want to do for my own CV that I got off of one of these sites. Um, and I know the person that wrote it and it's, it's very credible, but one thing that's easy is make sure if you're, um, that you uh, label, like if you have multiple pages that you put page numbers at the bottom, because what if something happens to one of the pages or if you, this isn't so much you guys right now, I would say, because you're, you have to submit it um you know through the through the website but if you're sending it somewhere make sure you send it through as a pdf so it doesn't get reformatted when somebody opens it from one you know from pages to word to some other format and it and it you know gets uh out of line um disformatted um another thing is like if you have one line at the bottom of something or if you have a heading at the very bottom of a page but then the rest of the uh, all of the components of your section are on the next page so make sure you just you know like you don't want like one line of something and then another the rest of it's on the next page make it look good in formatting look make it look pleasing to the eye it's kind of like a personal statement and and, and punctuation I mean again you want you want no errors that way, but you also want it to, to look well, because this is something that you kind of just are kind of skimming, glancing. It, it's a quick version you can look at and see somebody's accomplishments, right? Like, because if you have a heading that says accomplishments or publications, and there's one thing there, or you know, it, you know, a bunch of things there. It's a good way to know, oh, wow, look at all those publications. Wow, look at all that research. Wow, look at all this. So make sure and use your headings and then list things under there or the volunteer work or whatever it is. Just kind of, you know, organization, a readable font, the little simple things that, um, that make it look good and read well to the eye, to the reader. And for both your CV and your ERAS, um, make sure that you print it out and have multiple people go on there, read every single line with a red marker to make notations on any grammatical changes or like specific, like helping you pick better word choices. Um, 
I am going to be honest, I had some fatigue because I just kept printing out my ERAS, reading it over and over again, because I was so scared. I was so paranoid. I was going to miss something um, that eventually, like my last final read through, I read it out loud because I was getting so tired. I was I, I found myself skimming through words. So make sure you're like paying very close attention um, on your final read through of your ERAS before you hit submit, print it read it out loud, go on with a marker and make sure that it's like to the T what you want it to be. And I combed through my calendar, um, like I kind of scrolled back through my digital calendar to make sure that I was including all things that were important to me because things that you're spending time doing like are things that are important to you. So you might not think about them, but if you kind of look through your calendar that might kind of catch some extra things. I will tell That's you- It's a great idea, Megan great idea. And even better than what Megan just said is that you should just, anytime you do something and I started doing this, I put it on there. Otherwise I will forget. And I even, and it would take me so long to go back through my, my emails or my calendar and figure out when, well, when was it that I was on that panel or, uh, you know, did that lecture. I, I would probably just say, well, I'm just not going to bother because it's going to take too long. I'm just going to send this, but keep your, keep your CV updated. Um, always, if you go volunteer at a soup kitchen, you know, put it on there or, or something that, you know, that you do put it on there. So, and the date so that, you know, and you can keep them in order, um, of, of, you know, chronological is usually how people do it. I would say, uh, I don't know, Dr. Ross, is that the, the way that you suggest you're the CV expert? Re reverse chronological is what you want, right? You want the most recent to be the first thing that they saw. You don't want them to have to like dig through what your current position is and things like that. And for the students, what I do want to make a mention is what we're talking about right now is like your actual CV, like your living, breathing document that's like either on a Google file, always keep it on the internet. Um, you never know when your computer's gonna crash and you're gonna lose all copies, right? Like the internet is a much better place for it. And if anyone finds your CV, you're like, I don't want, what if Google hacks my CV? Google's just gonna be really impressed by who you are, that's it. Um, but when we're talking about the era CV, you don't get an option in the formatting and like the layout and things because it's all standardized for us to view. But it's really good to have that living, breathing document. So that way, when you make your era CV, it's good. If you don't have a CV and Eris is where you start, start working on your actual CV as well. Because the second you get to residency, right, and I'm sure Dr. Fernandez can vouch for this, right, like you're going to start applying for other things, you're going to start like, you know, submitting your CV to other things for like leadership positions, board memberships, all sorts of stuff. Cause you guys aren't going to just stop once you become an ER physician, you're going to continue throughout your entire career to advance, to become leaders. So make sure that you convert it into a workable format. And it's not like right now of your third year or fourth year, when you're trying to apply for jobs and you're like, Oh God, I don't have a CV even really started. And now you're going to spend like another 80 something hours working on that. Yeah, I have a friend who is it was trying to apply at my med school that I'm at to be <laughs> just a, a, a preceptor for the students at my school. And she said, my hang up, I can't get this done because I have not updated my CV since medical school. I mean, it so that's like 16 years ago. I mean, so you definitely want to keep these things updated or it's just it's almost I still think it's, it's impossible. So definitely write stuff down. A couple other um, just clues for application CV. So um, I do end up looking at your CV, not just at the ERAS CV. So we end up seeing both of them in your application. And a lot of times I'll I just prefer to look at the CV rather than the ERAS listings for whatever reason. Um, but make sure you highlight in your CV the really good stuff. Like if you graduate with honors, put that you graduated with honors right underneath your med school or your college or your graduate school um, line so that you can see we can see it there. You, we don't have to just look down and 
find, you know, gold humanism society somewhere deep down in your CV. You want that kind of stuff to be up in the top of your CV or up if it's appropriate, aligned with college or med school or whatever university experience. And the other thing that I would say is do make sure along with the like legitimate stuff that you're reporting, if you're reporting a publication or a research activity, make sure that you know what it was about. <laughs> so I have had situations that I've picked out a publication or a research interest for just to ask a question. It wasn't like I was looking for anything specific. I just happened to pick that out to start a conversation with um, a student and they couldn't talk about it. And that makes me know that, you know, we've all been there, done that, that you're, you know, on a paper because you did a tiny little part of the bibliography and you end up being an author and that's fantastic, but read the paper and make sure you know what the paper says and what it was about so that you can have an educated conversation about it for anything that you have in your research and on your CV. Don't just have something that you don't really understand and you just ended up being part of the team and you got your name on the paper. Um, so that's a, those are the two, but highlight the good stuff and put it, you know, I, a lot of people will go from their education to memberships and then they'll put things after memberships. And, you know, I, honestly, I appreciate the fact that you're a member of all these organizations, but I want to see what you've done. I don't want to see that you're a member of AEM and ASEP and everybody else high up on your CV, you know, highlight the, the, honor, the honors and the awards and that kind of stuff. And I think you have a little bit of creative license as well, um, like Dr. Carrick had kind of mentioned. So when I was doing my CV and Dr. Fernandez maybe, or anybody can kind of speak to this, but um, things that I wanted to highlight about myself were kind of like my leadership skills. And then also I had like some travel experiences that were pretty meaningful for me. So I kind of had like a leadership experience headline and then like underneath that was my like travel and prizes. And then, you know, I kind of like put my CV in order of what I wanted the person to look at because of, again, like the attention span thing. So after my education, I kind of highlighted the things that I thought were important to me. All right, before I go ahead and ask that next question, um, we have about 17 minutes left. So attendees, if you have any questions, um, whether or not it's uh, related to the application cycle, we have five fabulous EM physicians here, female physicians. So if you have questions about um, emergency medicine or just any year in medical school or anything like that, feel free to throw it in the chat box or the Q&A and we'll be sure to answer them. But until then, our next question was submitted by Molly O'Neill. And she wanted to know what kind of questions do you ask current residents along the interview trail? Or I guess current applicants is what she might mean. But Molly, you're on here, so let me know if I butchered that. So I think, right, um, at least for my program, we, we have a pretty rigorous interview day with like multiple faculty members and residents, you know, and I think that's pretty common throughout, but we do ask some standardized questions. And the reason why we do that is because, right, like if all I talk to you about your hobbies, right, then it gets really hard. What if everyone has the same hobbies, like, right? Like we're all yard dogs. We love mountain biking and rock climbing and mountains and fishing, right? Like that's right. Like, and we all have a North Place hoodie somewhere hidden in our closet, but realistically it gets hard if it's only just the hobby. So we do across, at least for us, we stand, we do every faculty member has a standardized question. I'm obviously not going to give you guys those questions because I don't want generic pre-scripted answers, but I will tell you what we look for, right? So we ask emotional intelligence questions, your ability to work in a team. How do you overcome like uh, conflicts and adversarial relations? what are your goals, motivations, interests? And then the last one is self-reflection. Like how was your ability to self-reflect about you as a person, right? Because those are the things that really take what it takes to be a good physician as a whole, right? Like working in a team, you're always like, right? Like day one, I'm sure Dr. Fernandez has experienced this, like a conflict between a nurse and a patient or something. And she is now the physician that's gonna have to deal with the situation. 
And we want to know, how do you approach these situations? Are you a decent human? You know, as one of my APDs puts it, like, do you kidnap people and lock them in your basement? Like, and if you do, do you feed them? Do you give them water? Do you let them watch Netflix? Right? Like all of those standard things, right? Like, are you just a good person? Do you, you know, or are you, do you have a complete lack of insight? Right? And most of you guys are really, really good. We're not looking for exceptional answers, but you'll be surprised how many times we ask somebody, a student something, and it's like, oh my gosh, you are such an arrogant little prick right? Like it is just like, like you have no social tact, right? And like, it's like, you're really good on paper, but you just, it's just not there, right? And those are the students that like tell every other student like, oh, they didn't like me because I was a DO or they didn't like me because of this. And they're really, it's not because of that. It's because you have a personality issue, but you just don't have any ability to see that, right? And, you know, I think all of us on here could speak. I would rather take somebody with a learning issue than a personality issue because I can fix the learning issue. That's why we're educators. It is really hard, near impossible to make somebody change their personality if they don't even recognize it's a problem from the get-go. We, uh, we always start off with the standard, tell us about yourself. You know, that's, I think most every interview, you're gonna get that. So I would have, you don't have to memorize something. Please don't do that actually. Don't rehearse to the point that it's like a poem, you know, coming out of your mouth, but um, but do have a, a, a uh, not too verbose, but also not too short to the point that you just say, well, um, my name is Angela Carrick and I'm here because, um, I want to be an emergency medicine physician because, I mean, we do want to know, like, or, you know, something about your, your upbringing, even before medical school, and then something of, you know, that about your, your reason for going into emergency medicine and a medical school part of it too, but not just why you're here today, why you want to do that. Um, and then I would be prepared to answer what is your strength? and tell us about a weakness and how you deal with that. And one of my pet peeves is when somebody tells me their strength is I'm a hard worker. Please don't say that. I, I just cringe when I hear that. I know you're a hard worker. You did medical school. I mean, probably- My weakness is I'm a hard worker. Oh gosh. I, it stretched myself too thin. Right, right. Well, I'd rather hear that, to be honest, than, than if you tell me your greatest strength is being a hard worker, because that is the most uncreated, you know, like just boring thing. Everybody's a hard worker. So tell me something else, because I know you're a hard worker. So tell me something else. And then please, when you tell me your weakness, don't turn it around and tell me how it's a good thing to have that as your weakness. Okay. Actually say why it's a problem and how you're dealing with it. So I would say those are the standard ones that we start out with kind of, or, you know, tell us the last book you've read, tell us about your hobbies, things like that. And then we'll ask you, uh, you know, of course, why you want to do emergency medicine, why you like it the most, what you feel is going to be a challenge in residency. Um, those are kind of the generic ones, I would say. I'd really love to hear from Dr. Fernandez on what was like the hardest interview questions. Cause I really think that's what the students want. Like they, they got these easy ones, but like, what were the hard ones that you got that you weren't expecting to get? I had a wonderful time on the interview trail. <laughs> I really didn't have any difficult questions. Um, I would say, I feel like the toughest question I was asked was what I was I struggled with the most um, in medical school because that like brought a little bit of raw emotion, um, which you have to be comfortable with um, being uncomfortable because you're just being honest, right? And you're letting someone know like, hey, this is what I really struggled with and this is how I grew from it. But um, it kind of exposes you a little bit. So I feel like that was, um, a little bit difficult for me because I was afraid of being judged, um, but it, it wound up just fine. Um, I really did not have any difficult questions, but I did get asked a lot. Every single interview said, tell me about yourself, every single one. So you, you will accidentally memorize your elevator pitch because you will do it for every single interview. 
I, I do not think people prepare for, the, for these interviews then, because do you know how many times I have asked that and people do not have a good answer? I mean, they don't. So you probably thought your interview wasn't bad because you prepared. So please prepare you people that are on this webinar. I mean, you, you are obviously preparing. So I'm sure you will have a great interview like Dr. Fernandez, but it is those people that show up and they think this is just a conversation. But I do feel that preparation is appropriate and necessary. And I would say, make sure that you have a non-generic answer as to why you wanna to go to that program and what you can bring to the table for that program. Because anyone can read that website and pick out what aligns with their interests but you sit through their you know all of like all of the residency fairs you sit through their socials you've read through their social media postings and all of these things like by the time you get to the interview you should have an exact reason that is unique as to why you want to go there and why you are a good fit for that program and be direct about it. If you're asked that question, or if you have the guts to straight up tell them like, this is why you should take me, you should be bold and declare it as such in a non-aggressive manner, obviously. And I have to say, just to kind of piggyback off of what you said about like your hardest question kind of being the one that you felt raw about Dr. Fernandez, um, same for me. So when I interviewed, um, what I was self-conscious about was my step one score being eh, and I think probably more people than not have eh scores than like super awesome scores. So for me, like that was what I felt um, worried about in my application. And so I felt like that was like a big weakness of mine. And it also made me feel like I wasn't maybe good enough to be at certain programs. Um, but that was also because it was a low score, I, I did always get asked about it too. So like my first couple of interviews, I knew I was going to get asked about it, but it was still a little bit I mean, raw is like just a great word that you use. It kind of just like makes you feel a little bit raw to be asked about what you think is your weakness. And you're like, oh, they're pointing out my weakness like right away. They know I'm too weak to be here. So just kind of like taking a moment, um, as Dr. Rossa kind of said, to kind of be self-reflective and recognize that we all have weaknesses and you'll all we all have like something on our resume that, you know, we're insecure about and whatever that may be. Um, and just recognize that you'll probably get asked about it and it'll probably make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. And I don't know if there's like a great way to prepare for it, but just like knowing that you're going to be asked about it, you're going to be a little uncomfortable, but like just own it because it's part of you and you're, they still like you that they interviewed, interviewed you. If they didn't like you, you wouldn't even be at the interview. So don't like get in your head too much about it. And don't be ashamed if you cry. I'm just going to say that right now. Um, my it was in our residency we kind of joke about like me making applicants cry but like I, I am stuck with the hard question and I ask everyone the hard question and it's an emotional intelligence question and on average there's never been in my last eight years that I've been at UIC a day where somebody did not cry during their interview right and it's not like a, oh God, they're crying. Like I'm a crier, give me a good gum commercial. That's a little heartfelt. I'm gonna cry on you, it's okay. Um, but like, it's not a bad thing to show your vulnerability. It shows that you're a human and there's nothing wrong with being a human. Actually, I prefer humans to robots um, because that tells me that you're able to process your emotions and you know work through them and not you're not gonna be the resident that bottles them up. And then I'm gonna find with like an alcohol use disorder in the middle of their second year, right? So like, don't be ashamed if you cry. Um, we have already started our interview process for our career rotators and we've had well over, you know, two thirds shared at least a single tier during it. And that's perfectly fine because it's a very vulnerable position to be in. We're not trying to make you cry by any means, but it's okay if you do. And it's also okay if you don't, like, don't be like, oh God, now I have to cry, right? Like, but it's okay if something is very raw and very personal to you and then you do have a real human emotion to that. I think it's really important to remember that when you when we bring somebody into interview, it means that you've made it through the initial screening. That when like 
when Dr. Gillespie talked about her boards, if your board scores weren't okay to get into our program, you're not going to get interviewed. <laughs> and I may talk to you about weaker board scores, or if you took a leap of like 40 points from one to the next, you know, how did you do it? And that might be a conversation, but if your board scores were going to be such that they, you were not good enough to come here, you wouldn't be here for an interview. So try to not be like worried, distracted by things like that. The interview, it, in my opinion, and, and most of my colleagues will say that, you know, we screen your application and decide that you're acceptable on paper to come to our program and you're offered an interview. We get, you know, most of us get a lot of applications. Last year, we had 1,700 plus applications for 15 spots. If you came and got an interview, that means that I thought, you know, you're good to go and I'm going to put you on our match list. Now I want to figure out who you are. And my questions that I'm asking you are to try to figure out if I think that you'll be happy, as happy as you can be as a resident, spending the next four years with us, do I think that you will um, help create a cohesive intern class? And do you have the characteristics that we look for that permits that class to be cohesive? And you know, I'm trying to figure that out by the questions that I'm asking you. I'm trying to figure out whether or not you want to take care of our patient population. I want our patients treated well. I, you know, there are people that just are, we're Einstein's in North Philadelphia and we have a very underrepresented or um, socioeconomically lower and, and um, you know, a, a very diverse patient population. There are people who do not want to work with that patient population. I want to figure out if you are, you know, wanting to work with that patient population. I want to figure out if you really tick by the, you know, unpredictability of a busy level one trauma center. I want to figure out, you know, all those things. So, so the, the initial screening is done. Don't be paranoid that you have something that's not going to be acceptable. That would have already been screened out. We just want to figure out who you are. Just be honest and open and, and, um, and prepared. Don't, it, you know, you have to figure out who you are in your head to answer the questions. So have stuff, you don't want to have it be all, you know, the same answers for everything, but you, you do want to kind of have figured out what your basic answers are so that you can, um, can know what's important to you and translate that to us. Well said. All right, if there are no other remarks, I'll go ahead and just give my closing remarks. Um, panelists, if you'd like to put in your contact information for the attendees, contact you later on, go for it. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I really hope that this was beneficial for all of you that are here. Um, we're, we only do this for you all. So if there's something you want to see differently, something you want us to address next time, please put it back in that feedback form that you receive after the session. And um, just to recap for the up or to let you all know what's coming up, uh, next month we'll be doing an ERAS sort of do's and don'ts, last minute tips and tricks since uh, we're about six weeks away from submission. And uh, in October, it'll be crushing those virtual interviews. So again, if there's something you wanna see, something you want done, let us know. Panelists, thank you so much for being here tonight. We very much appreciate your input. It was gold and we really couldn't be here without you. So thank you. Thanks for hosting. Thank you. Great to see Have everybody.